All right, everybody, welcome back to yet another segment of boot camp training, right? <laughs> Here's my boot, and there you are for the training. Welcome back. Um, all right, guys, so where did we leave off last time? We left off, right, we left off with allergens. Okay, great. So we shared a couple of things, if you're just joining us, if you haven't uh, watched the last module, we were talking about the big eight, right? Um, peanuts, tree nuts, soy, dairy, shellfish, eggs, um, fish, and wheat, right? So those are the big eight. And we were talking about the EpiPen. So um, if there is a situation where a customer is having an allergic reaction, because I didn't get to um, shed some light to that. If there's a customer that's having an allergic reaction, you want to have somebody stay with that customer. That way, if, if there's any, if anything happens and that customer needs your assistance, somebody is there. The other person that's going to be calling the ambulance needs to know what allergen that customer consumed. They also need to be able to tell the ambulance or the dispatcher that, hey, they didn't have one of these. If you are ready to use you remember, pull off red safety guard. It tells you how to use it. If not right? Ready to use. And this goes into the leg. Now why do you want to tell the ambulance driver or the dispatcher that it's a food allergen case? Simply because that ambulance driver or that particular unit may not have an EpiPen. Right? So on average, a person that's having uh, an allergen, a reaction to an allergen, has probably about 15 minutes to seek medical attention. All right, so I wanted to shed some light on that. Are there more than eight allergens? Yes. Um, some allergens are more severe than others for some people, and I'll share a story with my son. When he was uh, just about two years old, he would vomit immediately after eating something. Now, he ate everything, so we, I didn't know what it was. The, uh, the pediatrician said, keep an eye on it. Every time you feed him, watch what happens. So I fed him chocolate-covered donuts from Dunkin' Donuts, right? And um, I said, oh, I'm so happy. I was like, yes, he's vomiting, right? Um, so I said, it's either the donuts or the chocolate, because they were only chocolate-covered donuts. So I gave him donuts, nothing. I gave him chocolate. He threw up. I said, okay. So I'm narrowing it down. I gave him milk chocolate, threw up. I gave him regular chocolate, threw up. Um, it was a mess. I was doing a lot of cleaning, but I finally figured out it was all chocolate, all cocoa was, was creating a problem. So um, it was a severe enough allergy that he would vomit probably like two minutes after consuming it, that, that quick. So the, the, the pediatrician recommended that once a year on his birthday, feed him a little bit of the allergen and see how he does. And so I did that until he turned seven, no, six years old was when finally gave him some chocolate and he kept it down, gave him some more chocolate and the allergen was gone. I'm not a pediatrician, I'm not a doctor, I'm not telling you what to do, I'm simply sharing with you what happened with me. Okay, so the, the, can it go away? Yes. Will it? I don't know, I'm not, my, my master's is in education, not in medicine. All right, so keep that in mind, I just wanted to put that out there. Um, where are we going? Oh, I wanted to give you another number that, um, that I had gone through when we were going over the, the first uh, two reviews, assuming you're watching these in chronological order. I want to share with you another number, see if you can tell me what this is for, and it is 90 days. No, it's not a, an international vacation. Good guess. Uh, no, it's not when your next, uh, it's, it's not when your mortgage is severely past due. Although, thanks to COVID-19, actually regrettable. It's, um, there's, there's so much hurt out there, right guys? But 90 days, going back to food safety, 90 days is the length of time that you need to keep shellfish, tags after 
selling the last shellfish, right? So most establishments, what they'll do is as soon as the box of shellfish comes, they take off the label and store it. And then when they sell the last shellfish item, now depending on the restaurant, some might sell it quicker than others, right? But when they, so when they sell the last one, 90 days is how long that shellfish tag needs to be on, on record, on file. Okay, so that was one that I had, uh, that kind of snuck away from me inside of there. Um, we're going to be covering um, cooking temperatures next. Um, I'm going to lightly cover it because I want to give you more detail for it. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to share with you a refrigerator, which some restaurants are going to have a walk-in cooler. It's just easier to share it in with visualization using a refrigerator, right? And I'm going to keep it simple for this illustration. Later on, I'm going to draw another refrigerator because I love to draw. No, I'm just kidding. Because you're going to, you're going to learn how to thaw food correctly, and I need to show you another refrigerator later on too, right? But let's do this. Let's put a couple of shelves, right? And let me fix that last one because it's a little crooked, right? So there we go. So think of it this way. This is a quick way to 135. I intentionally left some space over here, and I'll explain to you why. Right, so 135, 145. These are the cooking temperatures. You know that they go incrementally in multiples of 10. Right, that's the easiest way to remember cooking temps um, when you're going to take care of your food manager certification. This is not a culinary class. This is a food safety class. Yes, there are different values for different foods, I know, but it's, it, I, there's no value in me overwhelming you with information because it's not going to help you with the Serve Safe Food Manager. So, 135, 145, 155, 165. I'm just going to use green because I'm going to use green, not because it means anything. Right? Even though for the first one, it, it is going to mean something. Right? So right here, it's going to be uh, fruits, veggies, and also RTE. So I'm going to deviate with RTE in case you don't know what RTE is. Right? So we cook. Oh, look, I misspelled veggies. Um, we cook, and now that looks like a five. Man... You know, when you're OCD, you can't just leave it there and keep going, right? But um, fruits, veggies, and RTE, you know who you are. I know I am, right? RTE is short for ready to eat, right? Most ready to eat food can be reheated to 135. Um, it was already cooked. Take hot dogs, etc., some, some microwavable dinners. Uh, things like that. 145. You know what? I, I am going to use a different color because it's going to start to look crowded if I just stick to green. 145. Um, the short and easy end of it. Think of steaks, chops, basically whole meats. Right? Whoops. 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 Oh, you know what? Over here. Oh, it's okay. We'll we'll keep we'll go. We'll come back later. I'll give you more detail later. But at least you can start planting the seed with respect to, um, to these types of uh, temperature settings. 155, we're looking at ground meat, right? Ground pork. Now, why does it, like a, a whole pork versus a ground pork, a whole steak versus... Uh, ground burger meat. Why is there a 10 degree difference? Because when you buy a, a container of ground meat, right? when you buy a container of ground meat, it's not one cut of meat. It's many cuts of meat. So in order to help reduce or eliminate the likelihood of foodborne illness, 
these are cooked a little higher than those. Okay? At the bottom, and I'm going to go back to blue, um, you're looking at poultry, stuffed foods, and reheating previously previously cooked food. Now we're talking about with respect to reheating previously cooked food, we're talking about food that I prepared. Right? So I just made a lasagna um, yesterday. So whenever I go to reheat that lasagna or that meat, I need to reheat it to 165. Okay, so those are some of the um, some of the values that I wanted to point there. Now, an easy way to um, oh, and I didn't give you this. So what goes up there? I'm going to use red on this uh, intentionally because the order changes slightly if I go to put certain foods in the refrigerator. Okay. So if I go to put um, a, a baked raspberry pie, right, it's already ready. Baked raspberry pie, I need to put it above the foods that could potentially cross-contaminate it. Okay, you know what I was going to add in here? And I'm going to put it in here. Um, eggs. Right, and there's differences in eggs, and we'll talk more about eggs later, because um, there, there are a couple of values, but let's keep it simple now, right? The KISS method. Keep it simple, stupid. Um, so now, any food that could potentially become cross-contaminated by another, you want to put it safely in that refrigerator, right? Like, let's take, for example, poultry. This is raw poultry. Right? All of this food is raw. Right? So raw poultry. Now if it's already cooked, I don't want to put it with the raw poultry. Right? I can store it potentially on that shelf. Right? But I don't want to put cooked steaks below the ground meat. Do you understand? Are you following me? So you want to always keep in mind where that food is on that new um with respect to having been prepared or not, so that you can you can correctly store it. Uh, obviously, restaurants have walk-in coolers; they're ginormous, but still, people make mistakes there too. The other thing is, when you go to put food in the refrigerator or your walk-in cooler, please cover it. Cellophane, a lid, do something to keep that food from becoming cross-contaminated or becoming a cross-contamination to other foods. Okay, oh, I still have my hat on. Look at that. It didn't look too bad. Um, <laughs> just realized that nobody said anything. That's all right. Um, so the other thing you can do here is take that refrigerator and flip it upside down, right? So that if it helps some of our visual learners, we know that 165 is hotter than 135. So take that refrigerator, flip it upside down. So this is where you would cook poultry to 165. Now there is no such thing as undercooked poultry because roughly 30%, roughly, okay? I know someone out there is going to Google it and you're going to find something a little different. So this is a best estimate. Roughly 30% of poultry is contaminated with salmonella. Okay, so... All poultry needs to be cooked well. Well done. Um, while I'm on the well done uh, choo-choo train, that's also something that is important with children's menu. Okay? With respect to a children's menu, children's menu, everything must be well cooked in a children's menu. There is no undercooking anything. Meaning this, that if a mom, dad, guardian, grandmother, whoever it is, is with that child, and I've seen this, good waiters, good servers, um, let's say the child says, like my kids, my kids were, they, they, 
I, I had them eating medium to medium rare or medium well burgers early on because it tastes amazing, right? Um, I knew their health, I knew they were okay, but when we would go to a restaurant and the server was taking the order, and they would hit one of my kids, and they would say, I want that burger medium. They would look at me and go, Dad, or is that okay, right? Because, God, you know, you know it's, it's an older brother and they're calling you Dad. But, um, but they would say, is that okay? Can he get it medium? I said, yeah, that's, that's fine. So um, train your staff to not simply go medium. Right now, here's what's important about everything that I'm saying. That burger that was just ordered medium cannot, cannot come out of the children's menu. All right? So if your children's menu has something for $5.99... Now, obviously, a children's menu, the portions are smaller, but, but little Johnny wants a medium burger. Usually, that, the prices on the adult side of the menus are going to go up substantially, right? They're, it's a bigger portion. So, it's, it's two things. One thing is children's menu, everything needs to be well done, but then communicate to your guests that it has to come from the adult menu, okay? So... That is a little tidbit with respect to um, to to uh, cooking temperatures, right? And a quick review again. It's so important. So we cook those meats. Please, oh, did I give you this? Yeah, I did already give you this. Um, keep keep certain things in the back of your head all the time because they're gonna come up, right? Your temperature danger zone. Right? Keep this in mind. TCS. This is important. If I didn't already give it to you. Temperature control for safety. Right? So there are things that you need to always be remembering. So we hear, we remember that it's 41 degrees Fahrenheit to 135 degrees Fahrenheit. Temperature control for safety means we keep hot foods hot and cold foods cold, right? When we transport food, it needs to be transported to maintain that temperature of 135 or higher or 41 degrees or less. Or we need to have heating or cooling elements when we arrive at that destination so that we can um, revitalize that food if you want to call it that, all right? Perfect. So the next section over here, what we're going to go with next, is a couple of things. Um, I covered this earlier. Um, I want to add one other component to it for you. So I'm going to draw the very best sink that I can. Right? So here we go. We've got this. There's your cold and you're hot, right? And then the little legs so that you know it's a sink, whatever. I, I think it got worse. It looks like a broken piranha. But anyway, so, oh, actually, you know what? If I can draw that, this is good. Okay, this will work. Okay, there are a couple of things I already showed you, but I want to show you new stuff too. In another video we said that the space there and the space there, right, because over here some sinks have that intentional break and then down here they have like this little um, the drain cap down there. So those spaces we identified already once as air gap, right? Over here we had an air gap. Now there's something else I wanted to show you that um, many of us don't don't know and I'm going to use a, the color green so that it stands out a little bit nicer because if you see a reference to it in, in the exam I want you to remember that I showed it to you. So that top um, area of the sink it's got a name. 
It's called a flood ring. Right? So now, what? that's why some sinks have these little holes or a little notch down there so that if this is clogged, the water can start to run down those little holes. Go to your bathroom and check it out. You, you've got a hole in the, in the sink right there facing you. Um, so that's, what, that's what's going on. Now if this were a hand washing station, the other thing you need over here is you need soap, right? Somewhere over here you need a sign that says employees must wash hands, which I shared with you on, on another video. So you need a sign. Um, you need, and I had it down there, over here, you need the trash, right? Um, what else are we, 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 obviously, I mean, right, we have cold and hot running water that you need. What else are we missing? See if you can find out. What else is missing? We need disposable paper towels. Now I'm going to date myself here. How many of you remember in the bathroom when there used to be that 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 little thing that you would you would pull a towel and you would keep pulling it and it was too it was pretty large, but it was a towel you would pull the clean towel out and as you would pull on it it would wind itself up on the other end. Then somebody would come in, remove the the, uh, the towel roll, wash it put in a clean one and that was that was that was hand washing back in the day right we didn't have disposable paper towels or, or or hand dryers and somebody came in and pulled a little towel out of there it was pretty neat um, with respect to um, I'm gonna jump just a little bit because we're, we're talking about about these little guys again and again and I really I am gonna be redundant on some of this stuff because it's so important and you must memorize it, right? We talked about those are the biggest culprits to food safety. That's the biggest culprit to food safety. We already shared what temperature. We said as hot as you can tolerate the water or 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's as hot as you can tolerate it or 100 degrees Fahrenheit. For how many seconds? I shared with you it was a total of 20 seconds, right? That's the total with 10 seconds used for what? 10, 10 seconds was for lathering and scrubbing your hands. Now, one thing I didn't tell you is that you should wash up to your elbows, right? Um, so again, I'm going, to, I'm going to revisit some of that information because it's, it's guaranteed that you're going to run into that. It's so, you know what I've noticed about COVID-19? Everybody is so concerned with protecting their, themselves, right? But in food safety, we've had so many food safety outbreaks because if I don't wash my hands, I'm not the one getting sick. It's the general public getting sick, right? So wash your hands. You don't know who your customers are. This is it. We touch everything. We touch the phones. We touch all this stuff. Wash your hands. And by the way, you're going to run into employees that say, my hands are already clean. I haven't touched anything. It's, how many of you haven't been shocked when you wash your hands and the sink ends up dark? And they're like, wow, my hands were clean. Right? But yet when you wash your hands, you see how much um, in Spanish the word is mugre. Right? What's mugre it's in English? Dirt, right? <laughs> Sometimes a word comes in in Spanish and it just bounces around in there. So, mugre, dirt. Um, wash those hands often. Wash them every time you switch tasks. If you see it on the test and it says every how many hours, if I'm working on one task for how many hours? Four hours. So, every four hours I should stop and wash my hands. And then the other thing is that when you go to put on a pair of gloves you need to have washed your hands thoroughly at 100 degrees and then here's a huge mistake I see right don't blow into your gloves 
Don't put gloves that are too small for your hands. They make gloves in different sizes. They make gloves in different colors. Um, and this one is already compromised. You see that? So again, encourage your employees not to worry about throwing out something that is not going to, that, that is not safe, that is com going to compromise the, uh, the public's health and let them get another pair of gloves. But they do make them in different sizes. Um, when I did the training on the field, what I found was also occasionally there were staff members at some of the locations I were training that would put on two or three pairs of gloves so they could take off one pair and, um, and not have to uh, wash their hands. Um, another thing, while I'm still here, because it has to do with your hands, can I work if I have a cut on my finger? The answer is yes. As long as I take care, as long as it's not pussing out, right? It's not gooey, it's like a, an infection, an infective cut. As long as I take care of it, wash it, clean it out, put on a bandage, put on a finger cut. A finger cut is basically like just that, right? So I can put one of those on, right? And then I can put a glove over that. Yeah, I can still work if I had a cut on that finger, okay? But I need to dress up that finger safely. Now, if it's pussing and oozing out, um, go, go get some... Go get it treated. Something else is something else is wrong. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, there's a lot going on, and again, I'm gonna you're gonna find me reiterating some past content because it just happens to work out in that particular page. So, I thank you for joining us for this segment. Um, same as before, if you don't already have the e-study guide and you want a copy of it, please let me know. Uh, please remember that you are the food manager, you're the food professional. You need to set the example for your team. Here is my email address once again at gmail.com and just indicate that you would like a copy of the study guide. I'll send it to you, I'll attach it, it's free. And it's yours, and good luck. God bless. Thank you for tuning in. Bye-bye.